want you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I want you to notice the text says, What shall we say to these things? If you look at verse number 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. This is a reference to the martyrs of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this very hour, our brothers and our sisters are being martyred right now. Fact is, probably in the last, in the first part of this 21st century, we have seen an increase in martyrdom in the saints of God as they go on to meet the Lord. The Bible says in verse number 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So what you can understand from that is regardless of what comes your way in this world, it doesn't mean that God's mad at you. He still loves you. And He may have a reason for it that you will never understand until you get to the judgment seat of Christ. I firmly believe the longer that I live as a Christian, that the judgment seat of Christ may not be all that we think it is. It may be a whole lot worse than some of us would like for it to be. And it may be a wondrous day for some of the saints of God, but it's where it will be hashed out for the way we've treated each other in this life. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is for. has nothing to do with your salvation. That was settled at the cross when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's a one-time thing never to be repeated again. But our stewardship, the way we treat each other, our faithfulness to the call that God's given us, my friend, the dispensation of the gospel and all that goes with it, that will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. It's easy for Satan to wear you out if you're going through a hard time. He can make you think that God has turned on you and that God has turned a deaf ear to what you are going through in this world. I just told you about a terrible tragedy that has just happened in the last few days. I don't suppose anybody in the house today, if you take a good long look at that, could say, well, I'm in worse shape than that. No, 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 no. These people need your prayers, folks. This is what comes on planet Earth. I've lived long enough to know that a day can bring forth more than you could ever imagine. And it is full of surprises. Life has all kinds of surprises. But I want you to notice what the Bible says here is against you. Your, the world is against you. The flesh is against you. And the devil is against you. Amen. The world wants to control, silence, render ineffective any Christian that would dare speak against its sin. If you want to bring the wrath of this ungodly world down upon your soul, you do what Kim Davis did up in Kentucky, and you will be the brunt of every joke. They'll come down upon you like you wouldn't believe. As I told the Sunday school class this morning, Shepherd Smith took this woman and he took her apart on his uh, so-called news program on Fox Fox News Network, he said some horrible things about this lady. But my friend, he could never understand where she's coming from. Only those who have been saved understand where she's coming from. I'm not concerned about what she was ten years ago. What she is now, because she got right with God. That's what matters to this preacher. Four years plus ago, she got saved at her mother-in-law's funeral. God got a hold of her and got her attention, and she got saved. Hallelujah. That's what it's about. It's about being saved. It's not about how righteous you are and what a good life you've lived. And when you get to heaven, you can say, Lord God, I've been a good person. And now what part of heaven do you have reserved for me? God says there is none righteous. No, not one. The only way through those gates of glory into the presence of God is by the blood shed at the cross at Calvary. Applied to your soul, you must be born again. Amen. And so, my friend, the world wants to control you. The flesh wants to bind you up in the same sins that destroyed your life before you met the Lord. Sin is a way of lying dormant. 
It can lie dormant for years and not give you a problem. I'm talking about the kind of stuff you were in before you got saved. And then under the right circumstance, with the right people, at the right place, and at the right time, you will be amazed at how it can raise its head up and literally try to dominate your life. Sin will do that to you. Every sin you ever committed before you got saved by the grace of God is recorded in your flesh and in your fleshly mind. And every pleasure you ever enjoyed as an unsaved person, the flesh remembers and will never forget. And when it has the opportunity, it will reach up and seize upon your very soul. And the only one that can stop it is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. The devil wants to destroy you. Period. How do I know that God is for me? He's long suffering to us, word. Some of you God has put up with for a long time. He's told you what you're doing is not right. And yet day after day you continue to practice same old sin until you get to the point where you say how we reason in our mind. You say in your mind, well, since God hasn't judged me, Apparently, it's going to be okay with Him for me to continue in what I'm doing. But my friend, the day will come when God Almighty will set your barley field on fire. He'll get your attention. He'll let you know that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. How do I know that God is for me? He is merciful to me. Even though that I don't acknowledge it. Some of you today, God has been merciful, merciful, gracious, long-suffering. He's brought you to a point by a gentle hand. He's born long with you. And He's brought you through the way where you didn't have to fight your enemy. Like you would have if you've been established in the faith. He's dealt with you as a baby. He spoon fed you. He's fed you on milk. But you're never going to grow but so far on milk. The time is going to come when you've got to step out and begin to feast on meat. And when that day comes, God Almighty will have to show up in your life. He's faithful to feed, clothe, and give us shelter. He's faithful to forgive us of our sins. How many of you have ever been forgiven of a sin in this house? Some of you don't know how to forgive because you've never been forgiven. Some of you have never been convicted. You don't know what it is for the heart, my friend, to break out in a cold sweat. And for you to know that you're condemned to hell fire. And there's nothing you can do to save your soul. But my friend, He loves us. He's forever seeking our good. Listen to this in Psalm chapter number 40 and verse number 5. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned in order unto thee. I, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. God has good thoughts toward us. The Bible says in Psalm 139 verse 17, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Hallelujah. He just began to understand the graciousness and mercy of God. How that God was still thinking toward him. Jeremiah chapter number 39. Chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The benevolent Father, the Father of mercies, the Father of grace, the Savior of my soul, the Lord God Almighty is a good God. Amen. He's been a good God to me. If I end my life this day and never see another sunrise, I'll have to say to you that God has been good to this preacher. He's a good God. And let me say this to you if you don't know Him. I highly recommend Him to you. Amen. You've never had a friend like Jesus. Nobody ever loved your soul like Jesus. He's good, my friend. He's benevolent and gracious and long-suffering. He extends mercy to thousands, to tens of thousands, to hundreds of thousands. And today in this house, if you haven't been forgiven, it's only because of the coldness and hardness of your heart and not God. For He has made the way wide open. You can come to Him freely by the cross at Calvary on a blood path that was shed at the cross a covenant that binds God to man you can come freely and be born again hallelujah to God 
We know what the Bible says about the potter and the clay. The Bible says he took the clay and made a vessel, but it was marred in the hands of the potter. And when it was marred in the hands of the potter, this is the best part of the message. He didn't throw it away. He made it again a new piece, a different piece. That is most of us. I'd say probably all of us. I'd say all of us. I know me for certain that God meant for me to be exactly what I am. But how many times was I marred before I got to where I am now? The potter never touches the clay. His hand never touches the clay. If God Almighty and His holiness ever touched you, you'd be finished. You'd be done for. You'd be gone. He only touches the clay by the medium of the water. The water in the hands of the potter touching the clay. And the water is a picture of the Holy Ghost. It's the way He works mysteriously in our lives. It's the way He guides us, directs us, moves us, cheers us, gives us joy and peace and grace, and gives us light and understanding. It is the work of the Holy Spirit of God to draw us to Christ, to build Christ in us, and then ultimately to draw us to the Father. The Holy Spirit of God is everything to the believer. I'm so afraid there are so many churches and so many people. It's all rote memory or it's all literary or it's all cut and dried. It's all physical. It's all something printed on a paper, but it has nothing to do with the heart. The Holy Spirit works in the heart. And that's how God takes the clay and the potter forms the clay. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. How does the devil destroy us then? How does the devil destroy us? And I'm going to give you two things this morning and think on these. He destroys us by blinding us to the goodness of God. And he destroys us by accusing God to us. You can build yourself in your own self-ego and you can become so puffed up and so proud of who and what you are and what you've accomplished that God has no place in your life. You appeal, you appeal your smart, your ability, your talents, your gifts. All of this stuff is what you live by, but you don't live by His strength. This is why God's got to bring us down. He's got to bring He's got to jerk the rug out from under us. Sometimes He's got to let us fall and fall hard. Sometimes it's only when we're lying flat of our back that God can really begin to show us how much He truly loves us. Because until then, you got Him shut out. Too much of you, too much egotism. Too much narcissism. That's a big word that simply means it's all about me. I'm the greatest thing in the world. Look how smart I am. Look what I've accomplished. Leave me alone. I'll take care of it. Yes, you will. You'll tear your house down right on top of your head. God Almighty is a good God. His goodness is what leadeth thee to repentance. But the devil wants to blind you to the goodness of God. He wants to put doubt in your mind about who God is and His purpose in your life. He wants to put a hard, hard spirit of criticism in your soul. Your attitude toward God and your attitude toward life and your attitude toward each other will control what you become as a Christian. If you allow Satan to work on your heart and your mind, he'll fill it full of skepticism and doubt. He'll fill you full of bitterness and anger. He'll fill you full of the very things that will rob you of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it'll all be up here, but there's nothing working down here. And the joy is gone. My friend, let me tell you something. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to walk in victory. If you walk in victory and you have joy and you have peace, you got power of God. And as long as you got power with God, you can say to this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it will be done. Because faith will build up in your soul. Faith will rise up inside you. But Satan wants to blind you to the goodness of God. God's a good God. You can't keep yourself alive for one second. That heart beats, beats, beats. All of this stuff going on inside the human body. God knows exactly everything it takes for your human body to continue to function. And it does it day in and day out, day in and day out. How many of you got up this morning and said, thank you, Lord, I can breathe. Thank you, Lord, I can see the sunshine. 
Thank you, Lord. I got my family around me. I got my home. I got my ministry. I got my life. I got a job. I got food on my table. I got clothes on my back. Thank you, Lord. You're a good God. You've been good to me. How many of you get up in a day like that? Or how many of you get up and think, well, I don't have what this guy next door has got. And I want this and I want that. And you get this and you get that. And you got this stuff piled up all around you. You play with it for a day or two and throw it down. Then it's something else you want. How many agree with that? You got more stuff piled up everywhere. You can't even find your way through the house. Got junk everywhere. And you're not happy. You're miserable. And the reason you're miserable is because you don't have the joy of God moving in your heart. He's blinded you to His goodness. Amen. You wouldn't believe what a blessing it is to watch a little hummingbird go up to a thing and just... Watch him go in and out, 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 in and out. I just watch his little tail flips up and down like that. And I watch that little hummingbird and I think to myself, those little wings are flying just like that. I thought, good night, Mother Nature. Boy, you are smart, aren't you? I thank God for the beauty of a little hummingbird. The beautiful little creatures. They really are. And then I hear that hoot owl in the morning, and I hear that hoot owl at night. Then I hear that other hoot owl that answers to him. Then I heard my hawk yesterday. First time I'd heard the hawk screaming sometime. I thought, where you been, hawk? I hadn't heard you in six months. Hawk's back. Hallelujah. I'm listening to all those creatures out there, God. Amen. I'm one of those people to go out and sit down in the middle of a field somewhere in a forest away from every human being. And boy, the joy of God's all over my soul because I see his creation. His creation. Amen. I'm just a little speck. In part of that creation. Let me tell you something. The smaller a speck you become, the more joy you're going to have in your soul. Some of you are too big a blob. Look at me. Look at me. Well, I've seen you. And I just soon uh, get along with God. Because it's not going to do anything for my soul. Get out there with Him and watch His creatures. As they do what they're supposed to be doing. And then God, he accuses you to God. He accuses God to us. Satan will destroy you. And how do you know that Satan's destroying you? I'll give you six points. Here's how you know the devil is destroying your life, okay? Number one, you're wallowing around in self-pity. Woe is me. Everybody's been mean to me. Nobody loves me. I never get treated right. I didn't create this mess, but I'm the one paying for it. Oh, if I only had the opportunity that other people have. Every opportunity, every kind of an ex every kind of an excuse under the sun. Some of you live by excuses. It makes up all your life. You're constantly be making an excuse. You're wallowing in self-pity. Satan is eating you alive. Then you hide behind people. You want to know if Satan's eating you alive? You hiding behind people. I'm not as bad as so and so. I don't watch so and so what watch what they're watching. I'm not doing what so and so's doing. So it makes you feel good about yourself. What you're doing is feeling good about your own self righteousness. And self righteousness is one of the worst things that separates you and God. Ah, hide behind people. Let me tell you something, folks. Listen to me. This church is full of people you can hide behind. All kinds of people that you're trying to find somebody to hide behind, you don't have to walk long. Everywhere you look, there's some poor slob you can hide behind. Hey, I don't want to mess up your, I don't want to rain on your parade. Somebody's hiding behind you. <laughs> you make excuses for the sin that is destroying your life and the life of your loved ones. You want to know if Satan's consuming you? You're making excuses for it. You know what I mean by making an excuse for it? Well, like I said earlier in the message, well, you know, everybody's doing it. That's, that's the biggest excuse today. Everybody's doing it. Well, everybody blows their brains out in the morning. You going to join up with them? Everybody's doing it. Excuse, and, and number four, how do you know Satan destroying you? The very thing you preached about you're now doing. Yeah, you're doing what you preached about. And then finally, your family's coming apart. How do you know Satan's how he's destroying you? He's eating you alive? Your family is coming apart. How many of you think that there's something in this world more valuable than your wife or your husband and your children outside of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Families are coming apart in the church houses today. I have never in my lifetime seen as many divorces in the brew and are happening as right now. 
I'm meeting with people back here in this office on a regular basis. I've met with at least three or four different couples just in the last couple of weeks. Sitting in here talking to them and their families coming apart. Satan's eating you alive. Don't you understand what you've got to do to get that right? Get on your face. Go back to square one. Get little before God and let God get big before you. That's what I want to talk about next. How big is your God? If he's a little God created in your own image, he can't do much for you. That's what a man does. He makes a God in his own image. Let me tell you something this morning. This is the truth. Listen to me. When a man makes a God in his own image, that God is always just a little bit bigger than that man. Just a little smarter, a little bigger, a little greater. But the man always manages to elevate himself up to Godhood somehow or another. Let me tell you what the Bible says. There is none like unto me. Amen. Do you realize how big God is? I was listening to an astronomer the other day. And he's talking about this backside of the galaxy. Out here at the end of this thing. Out there somewhere. And they said there's billions and billions and billions. And billions of stars out there. And galaxies out there. And there's got to be billions of planets out there. Just like earth with people all over them. There's got to be billions and billions of people out there. To the ends of eternity. Wherever it goes to. And I think to myself. My goodness gracious. <laughs> there's just one God. And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And everything that God ever does with man, he's going to do it right here. And I do not believe for a minute that there's a man out there anywhere. The only place you'll ever find mankind's in the third heaven. In the presence of God. How big's your God? Is he big enough to do anything to help you? How big is he? Listen to what it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 40, verse 25. To whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their hosts by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord? And my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint <coughs> and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. God had to teach me that one. That was a hard one for me to learn. Which one, preacher? Waiting upon God. Amen. Oh, yeah. Might not have been hard for you, but it's hard for me. Why, preacher? I've always been a go-getter. I've always been the kind, if I saw something need to get done, go do it. I've never been one that has, that's afraid to try something new. I've stuck my head into stuff and learned how to do it by doing it. I've done it time and time. My whole lifetime's been like that. Didn't know a thing about woodworking. Just go out and start it. Didn't know a thing about wiring a house. Burnt two or three down before I finally learned how. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, that's the way I've been. Just go do it. Try it. Learn it. But when it comes to God, you don't push, you don't push Him. You don't force Him. You don't make Him. He doesn't work according to your time clock. When God gets ready to move, He's already prepared what He's going to move, where He's going to move it to, and He's prepared the people He's moving it to. He's considered every scenario and everybody involved, and He's got it all worked out. This is why timing with God is so important. The timing of the Lord. Timing. Timing. Well, I want to be healed. I do too. I want to be safe. So do I. I want food on my table. So do I. I want clothes on my back. So do I. So what do you do, preacher? You trust God. You rest in Him. You rest in His wisdom. In His timing. When He gets ready to do it. He'll do it. But He'll do it His way. And when He does it His way, He'll glorify Himself. And many times you'll have to be at the end of your life and you'll look back and say, I see the hand of God now. 
I couldn't see it then. How many times have I seen that happen? Give God the benefit of the doubt. Wait upon the Lord. Wait on Him. Preacher, you don't know how long I've been praying for such and such a thing. You don't know how long, you don't know how much I need such and such a thing. I don't have to know, but I know Him. And I know when He gets ready to do it, He'll do it His way. He'll do it the right way, and it won't be wrong. And God will, God will glorify Himself through it. Amen. They wait on Him. In the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 7, verse 22, Wherefore, thou art great, O God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. No, there's no other God. You can turn to the God, small g, they can't help you. Exodus chapter number 18 and Jethro. How many of you know who Jethro was, according to, related to Moses? As his father-in-law, as his wife's father, he was a priest of Midian. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein thou dealt proudly, he was above them. Ah, I got the right God. I got the right one. I got the right one. I'm on the winning side. It may not look like we're winning right now, but we're winning. It may not look like the church is going to make it, but the church will make it. It may, not look, it may look like right now the church is so infiltrated and so rotten and so corrupted that there'll be nobody here when Christ comes. Don't get the Elijah syndrome. They will be. We'll be here. And we'll be looking for him. In Isaiah chapter number 40, verse 6, it says... The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. <laughs> and then this last scripture. And man, does this not make you think. Psalm chapter number 78, verse 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. The temptation was one thing, but the limitation to God was even greater. In other words, what I'm saying is in God's mind and in God's character... God Almighty had rather have someone say to him, Lord, you can do above and beyond all that I could ask or think. Neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for them that love him. It's not, God is not bound by human intellect, by how much you can figure out, by even how much you can pray for. Romans chapter number 8 says this. Let me paraphrase it. Get your heart right with God, and God will pray for you in prayers that you can't even pray for yourself. Amen. Romans 8 says that the Spirit itself maketh intercession according to the will of God, with groanings which cannot be uttered. In plain words, if you want to walk between the cherubim and smell the sweet incense of worship and glory, if you want to walk into the Holy of Holies, if you want to come into the presence of God Almighty, you got to come in there with your heart, not your mind. Your mind will conflict with God's mind. We're made that way. We're wired, hardwired that way. Yeah. We're hardwired to where we've got to figure it out. We've got to make it work. We've got to be us. We've got to make our mark. But God says in Romans chapter number 8, you don't even know how to pray for what you ought to pray for. So what do you mean by that, preacher? God knows exactly what you need spiritually. He knows what you need physically. He knows what you need to walk with Him more than you do. All He asks you to do is to turn your heart over to Him and lay it out before Him and say, Lord, I don't know where I'm headed, but I'm trusting you to get me there. Lord, I don't know what I ought to be praying for, but I'm trusting you to intercede for me and pray for that very thing. Lord, in plain words, I'm going to cast myself at your feet as a little child and trust you with my life. 
And you can't do more than that. You should not do less than that. You should come to him today and say, Lord God, here's my life. This is the most precious thing. This is me. This is who I am. I mean, this is my life. I'm, this is my existence. My existence is in your hands. I think I know what I ought to pray for. And you should know to pray for certain things. But he's talking about the higher things. He's talking about the greater things. He's talking about that spirit walk in Romans chapter number 8 that brings you in the very presence of God. That's what he's talking about in Romans 8. Romans 8 is one powerful chapter. And that spirit walk in Romans chapter number 8, that spirit power that comes with that walk, that spirit understanding of the real battle that rages, he says, you don't even know what you ought to pray for. But the spirit itself maketh intercession according to the will of God. That's where I want to be today. I want to be here. Lord God, you don't have to explain it all to me. I don't have to be able to understand every bit of it. We don't have to put it down some textbook and break it down like you would under a microscope. I just believe it. Like this brother said in his King James Bible, Amen. I believe it. Yes. Whether I understand all of it or not, I believe it. Yes. Brother, same here. There's a lot of things. This is the mind of God. There's a lot of things about the mind of God that I don't understand. But believe me, from cover to cover, I believe every word of it. Amen. Father, I pray you'd use what I've said this morning for the glory of God. Somebody in here, Lord, need direction. They need it and they need it. They need it. I don't even think they understand how much they need it. They need direction. Father, lay your hand upon their soul. Let them feel your hand in their life. Let them feel the Holy Spirit saying to them, it's okay now. It's okay. It's okay. I don't have to tell you what I'm going to do, and I don't have to tell you how I'm going to do it, and I don't have to tell you where I'm taking you. All I want from you is just simple obedience and trust and faith. And put your life in my hands. That's what you want from us. That's what we give you by the grace of God. In Jesus' name, you said that all things will work together for good. Thank you. Amen. Let's stand up, brother. What have we got? Page 17 in your All-American.